I'm so happy you're here. Oh, I'm actually so happy all of you are here. Wedding MBA 2023, how are you guys? So first of all, 10 a.m. Wedding MBA, can't thank you enough for being here. Cannot tell you what it means to have a room filled with other wedding planners, event designers, artists, and creatives. When I started out in this business and I opened up my own company, Wedding MBA was the first conference that I ever came to, and The Knot was the first place that I ever put an ad. And we've all seen The Knot, we've all heard of The Knot, we've all heard about The Knot, especially fairly recently. But I'm gonna tell you that I booked my first client off of The Knot. I booked my first six-figure piece of business off of The Knot, and I found my first client that was willing to pay me six figures from The Knot. And so it's an incredibly worthwhile place for you to go, for you to invest your time, your money, your energy, and your effort. I love it. I highly encourage you to go down to the booth, talk to them, have a conversation. They're really great girls. You're going to have a great time with them. So we are talking about party on wedding trends. I talk about trends every single year and I always say that I find it hysterical because I'm about the least trendy person that you will ever meet. <laughs> Hello. This is this is fall black. You just missed summer black. But catch me in a couple of weeks. I have a beautiful winter black suit. It's this only it looks darker. But when it comes to the work, we all want to be timely and timeless. We wanna be able to pull a very classic, beautiful thread through the work that we are producing for our clients and our community, really because you want things to look new. You want things to look like what's coming next, but you also want the work to look really good and really beautiful 10, 15, 20 years from now. And so when we're talking about design trends, the first one that we are gonna jump into is being green with envy. 20% more of the clients that are coming up are looking to add green into their wedding designs. Now, why? Aside from the fact that it is surprisingly approachable and very neutral when you do it in mass, green is something that occurs in nature. So you're going to see a lot of it. The other thing about green is that it matches with everything. You can do green and pink, you can do green and white. It's very affordable. So when you're out there and you're looking and you're saying, how can I make a tremendous impact from a design perspective? How can I add more so that everything looks bigger and fuller and lusher and more expensive? Doing pieces that are wholly in greenery are going to be a great way for you to really stretch the dollar. We spend $1, we make it look like we spent two. That's always the goal so that we're maximizing budget. But when you start looking at color and you're saying, what do I wanna do to bring in color? We had a long time where it was just pure white, then we had champagne, we had a lot of pink. You're gonna see a lot of peach now. People still love pink, especially in the Barbies days, but peach is a little bit deeper. It's a little bit warmer. When you bring peach in, it looks more couture, it looks more intentional because everyone expects pink. Everyone expects another very pretty pink wedding but when you add peach and you've got that little bit of an orange tonality, you've got like that warmth of the sun, peach will look like somebody took the time to think about what do we want to put in the space? How can we make the space look a little bit more couture? How can we make it look a little bit more special than all the other pink weddings? And you don't just have to mix it with pink. Peach can mix in with fall colors as well. So if you look on this, we did this whole big, beautiful floral wall, and then we put little pieces of peach in it because it felt more like fall. It didn't feel as like summery, and it certainly didn't feel as soft. I know a lot of times when we are working, if we happen to have a couple that is a bride and a groom, it's the bride that's driving design. But a lot of times a groom will feel uncomfortable in like the pretty, pretty pink wedding. Peach gives you something that's just a little bit more edge and it's a little bit deeper and it doesn't feel as like overtly feminine as pink does. So one of the things that we also are seeing in design are big statement trees. I love a tree moment. 
I love a tree outside. I love a tree inside. When we first started, I was doing a lot of like little tabletop manzanita tree branches, but you can put a tree pretty much anywhere. This is a tremendous tree. This is about 14 feet high. It's built out on a metal frame. And then because I spent so much of my client's money on the structure and I still wanted it to look full, this is where we tied in that green because I was able to make it look really, really big and really full. Your trees don't have to be full. I love a petrified tree look, especially if you're going to do something in the winter, if you're gonna be doing something outdoors and you want to bring in a really natural element. These were hand carved out of styrofoam and placed up and then painted. So you can do all sorts of trees. You can have trees that are flanking the sweetheart table that are behind because they really just kind of come over and they hug the couple. If you're outdoors or if you're in a really, really large space, sometimes your couple looks like teeny tiny floating little people out there and you wanna bring the space down and create some romance and create some intimacy. Trees that are hovering will do that for you. And you can make, they don't need to be literal. You can do trees with crystals. You can do trees with gold. You can do trees and put the flowers around the base. But a tree is a great way to bring in the outdoors. And also, again, as opposed to this is my 12 inch round centerpiece that I'm just putting in the middle of the table. It looks like you spent the time to design something that feels special. And every time you build a tree, the tree is going to be different. So you're never going to have that level of like sameness and oh, it's the exact same tree I saw at so-and-so's wedding. You've got unlimited possibilities in terms of what you can add and what you can take away to make the tree very specifically built for your couple and for your clients. And you are going to see a tremendous amount of restraint coming in for the rest of the places. I'm somebody who believes that more is more and bigger is better. The bigger the moment, the grander the memory. I always want people to feel incredibly overwhelmed, but we are having this kind of Sophia Ritchie effect with like stealth, wealth, and luxury. And when you have so much happening, especially a big tree, especially one color saturation, in order to give your eye a break, and to give the guests a second where it's calming, we see people bringing their centerpieces is, making them a lot more compact. We're not seeing the light and airy. We're not seeing the blooms kind of popping up all over the place. We're seeing something that is a lot more controlled in the environment, and we're keeping them very, very low. Right now, more than ever, I mean, the pandemic, all of that, we're done, we're back. But the residual effect of that is people aren't guaranteed time together anymore. We're working from home more often, so we're not seeing our friends and colleagues. We're not always traveling for the holidays. And so the reason that you see this is because when we come together, when we gather, when we put a whole bunch of people in a room, you wanna be able to see them across a table. Even if you're not gonna scream across the table to chat with them, you wanna have that sight line from one person to the other. And it doesn't seem like a design element, but it is. How many people got pandemic puppies? How many people, there you are. All my friends, all my dog people. We were stuck, we were at home, we were craving someone and something to love. And so, so many people got dogs and now they're together and they want their dogs to be a part of their experience. And in the last year, I have had two couples that were so insistent on having their dogs at the wedding that they went and they had them certified as emotional support animals. Because once they put on the vest, nobody can say anything. And so people are saying, how can I make the dog's outfit special? How can I make the leash special? How can I dress the dog up with flowers so that the dog really matches the rest of it? And if they can't have the dogs, then we're seeing them show up in other places. So this couple has four pandemic puppies. And so we actually had them made in fondant and put on the groom's cake. And then because we wanted to pull the dogs throughout the entire experience, we had them sketched and put on napkins. And so every time somebody got a cocktail, every time somebody got an hors d'oeuvre, they were given something and the dogs were on there and everyone just loved it. They thought this is so much fun and the dogs are here and they're great. 
So look for ways to bring in animals, pets, but especially puppies, as long as they are well-behaved. I did get jumped on by the big one, and so that's why he's no longer allowed to come to weddings. As we're setting up the rooms, again, we want to be close to each other. And having a six-foot table separating us, that span, is no longer what people are looking for. They really want to close the gap and put people together. And so we are seeing weddings where we're just doing all long banquet tables. We're doing really long banquet tables that are coming in and lining a walkway. We really wanna make sure that these tables are beautifully done. And you'll see a lot of these pictures I chose because I wanted you to see multiple trends coming in together and how you can mix and match these so that when you're designing and when you're presenting something to your clients, you've got enough on trend that the work looks and feels really interesting. So in this one, you've got the really long tables, you've got the low reserved restrained centerpieces and people feel like they can be together. And then if they do want to do something high, you don't need to just keep the high centerpieces on the round table. You can actually build a structure and you can take the table runner that you would normally place on the bottom and you can actually lift it up and bring it above. So you're not impeding anyone's line of sight. You're not stopping people from seeing each other and communicating across a three or four foot banquet table, but you're giving it enough fullness and enough restraint so that it's beautiful, but it's also really approachable. And you'll notice we have a lot of linenless tables. So when you are starting out and you're starting to design, and you're starting to do all of these things, the first thing you do when you get a table, and is it okay if we talk about like business progression and how you go from one place to another? All right, I like trends, but I love business and I love making money and I love helping other people make money. So one of the things that I remember when I first started is you go to a venue and they say, your tables and chairs are included. Okay, great, what does that mean? It means you get a five foot round, you get a six foot round, you get a white linen or you get a black linen. Okay, I can work with that. I can do some cool centerpieces, I can do some greenery, I can make it look a little bit more elevated. Then your clients start to have more money and they start to be willing to invest a little bit more. And you go, okay, what's next? The next thing you do is you go out and you start renting linens. So maybe you're not doing a poly blend, you're doing something that's a silk or that's got a little bit of you know, a pattern on it. But eventually, as you start to move up from a design perspective, you're gonna find that people are really interested in linenless tables. And one of the reasons that linenless tables are so great is because they feel residential. With the exception of like, you know, my mother and my grandma in the 80s back on Long Island, you know, then it, Andrea, get the tablecloth. Company's coming, like you put the tablecloth down, everyone understood it. Now you're seeing in homes, beautiful wooden tables, mirror tables, glass tables. And so we're seeing that people don't necessarily want to just have the same, hi Ellen. All right, you're seeing that people don't want a linen, they want something that feels like it's the things that they live with, that it feels like what they love and what they have already, but it's a little bit more elevated. It's a little bit nicer. And you don't need to just stick with a round or with a long. You can do something like a serpentine table. A serpentine table is interesting because you can take four of them and put them together and you can create that donut table moment where now you can build something like a tree. You could build something like, you know, a huge kind of garden in the middle of it. Or you can wind them and snake them around together so that you have something winding through the room. Especially if you have a really big space. If your client falls in love with a room that's just too big for them, you want to fill it with stuff so that it doesn't look like half their guests said no. So a serpentine table is a good way to cover a big footprint and let people have a fullness, but you never wanna put a linen on one of these tables because they will crinkle. So this is another one, all long linenless tables, all very compact, low centerpieces, lots of greenery. 
And so this when you take apart these elements, a long table isn't new. A small centerpiece isn't new. Greenery isn't new. But when you mix them together, people don't always expect to see them in this way when the entire room is filmed with it. Because en masse, anything that you want to make look expensive, just do a lot of it. Because anytime you have volume, it looks like you've spent more and you've put more time and you've put more effort into it. But if you are going to do a linen, you really need to start looking for texture. There is nothing that I hate more than a crease in a linen. Your decor company came and they put them on the hangers and they rolled them in and now you take them out and they've got that line. You've spent so much time picking everything, making it look so beautiful, making sure that everything was done. And then you get these creases and they really do ruin your photos. And your photos are the only thing that you have that's gonna allow you to sell your wedding in the future. So you wanna look for linens that do have a texture. Applique is great because you're not going to actually see any creases. So if you can find something that has a little bit of a flutter to it, it's got a little bit of extra movement, that's a great way. Another way is to do something that is velvet. Velvet is fantastic because as soon as you put it down, you run your hand over it and all of those creases really disappear and they give you a much cleaner base that you're able to build from. We are going to see themed parties. So I started out with the peach color. This is pink. Do you feel the difference in terms of like the warmth, the approachability, the fact that this looks very decidedly feminine? So themed parties, this is pink. This is true bubblegum, bright, feminine pink. This could be hard for a groom to accept. This could be hard for a groom to want to be in. Now, this was a Barbie-esque themed party. So right now we do have a lot of cultural influences. We have a lot of the Barbie movie coming in. We have a lot of that kind of throwback retro candy shop feel because people want to go back to the good old days. They want to feel like they're in a time that isn't as difficult as the one that we may be living in now. But we also see people doing parties that are connected to the place that they're hosting their event. So we had a wedding in Lake Tahoe and one of the things that we did was we had a ski day planned. So the night before at the welcome party, we converted the ballroom into a really luxe upscale ski lodge. And we built and brought in all of the really special tiny touches. We took the gondolas and we had one built and that became our photo experience. So anytime that you are going to be making a decision, anytime you're gonna be putting something in, there are so many options for you to build things now, more so than ever before. You can do them on foam core, you can do them on printouts, and you can create something that ties into your environment that lets people really dive deep into the location. So these are little igloos that people could go outside in the snow they could take their pictures. We had some fire. You did cocktails and hot toddies. This was super great because you're out there, you're in the cold, and you really want people to have a place where they can be warm in an environment that's already a little bit chilled. And then we're using themed parties to tell better stories that connect to who our clients are. So this was another welcome party that we did, and this was one night in Dubai. And the couple had celebrated their engagement overseas. They took a vacation to Dubai. And so we said, okay, well, we're not bringing everybody to Dubai. Let's bring Dubai to them. So this was something. And Reverend Roxy, who's here in the room, is a really good friend of mine. And she's wonderful if you haven't met her yet. But she actually officiated this wedding for this couple. And we were able to pull these design elements in, whether it was the candle or the flowers or the camels. And then she was actually able to talk about this in their wedding ceremony so that you're just taking and pulling a design thread and a theme and you're pulling it through the entire experience to make sure that your guests don't miss anything. They don't miss an opportunity to figure out who your couple is. They don't miss an opportunity to learn about how they came together. When you're planning and when you're designing, there are three things that three couples that you're always really trying to talk to. 
You're trying to explain who your couple was when they first met, when they first started dating, when they first came together. You're telling all of the guests who they are now as they're deciding to get married. And you're telling a story about their future. This is very aspirational because this is a couple who says, we want to travel. We want to experience things. We want to go to other places and do other things. So when you're looking at trends and you're looking at a way to design for your trends and for your couples, don't just think about the thing in front of you. Really dive deep with your couples into who they are and what it is that they want, and then use the design elements to tell a story and to create a different experience. We have a lot of dynamic lighting coming in. Lighting is one of the real unsung heroes of an event because you plan all this and you put it all together and then you can't see it. So getting together with a lighting company that's really super talented, that understands how to manipulate light so in the first picture with the long tables, we had light coming from above with the chandeliers, and then we had the light actually down on the tables with the candles. In the black and red photo, we didn't wanna do anything in the ceiling, but white candles were going to be too white in such a really dark room. If you're looking for a way to do something with lighting without spending a ton of money, find somebody or order online custom colored candles because it's a nice way to add another level to subtly play with lighting and to give you something interesting because people don't always expect to see that. Another thing that we really love is finding lighting that changes throughout the night. I showed a slide earlier of the black and white room and everything was very pristine black tables, white flowers, big dazzling white chandeliers. As the night went on, we used lighting as a way to tell people what was coming and what was expected of them. I'm a huge fan of DJs, love the DJ community. DJ Russ is here, he's fantastic. And he would never get, I would never expect him or anyone else that I know to get out of mic and be like, ladies and gentlemen, now we're doing this. Ladies, now we're doing that. By changing the lighting, from the white to dinner to now all of a sudden making it pink, making it red, people understand that we're progressing on in the evening. Now you are expected to dance. Now, you're ex now it's party time. Now we're all getting ready and we're moving. And the energy here is different. The white is a lot calmer. It's a lot pristine. It's a lot cleaner. And so people aren't going to be up and looking at it and interacting with it. They're able to focus on their meal and on each other. But when the light gets red, when the light gets pink, when things get warm and hot, the energy shifts and you're able to see that now people are going to start chatting, they're gonna start moving and they're definitely gonna be out on the dance floor. Another big thing that we are seeing is interesting lighting in ceremonies. So when we talk about wedding planning, when we talk about event design, so many of our couples come to us and the big thing that they're thinking of is the reception. They really want to plan for the reception and the party. And I get it, it's where you spend the most time, it's where you spend the most money, it's where most of the pictures and the videos are taken, but the ceremony is why we're here. This is why we've all come together. This is where you say I do. And so the ability to do something interesting at a ceremony, especially with lighting, is always a really good spot. So um, we actually had over uh, I think we had 24,000 strands of little tiny lights that we put up in the sky. But this is another approachable, affordable way to do lighting because these are everywhere. They're at Home Depot, they're at Lowe's, they're at Walmart. And so if you can go and get a lot of twinkle lights and put it together, it's really dynamic, it's really interesting, and it's very, very soft and pretty and romantic. And the last thing that we are seeing are made to order atriums. So people don't want the same thing that everybody else has had. People want to create new environments. They want something that people haven't seen before or that is never gonna be seen again. And when you're building something out, the ability to build an atrium, this is really, it never existed before now. 
It was never here before. It's never going to be here again. Matt, who's in the back of the room with me from M Place Pro, has been doing my BTS videos since 2018. I show them here a lot because one of the things that we as artists and we as creatives really struggle with when we're talking to our clients is getting them to understand what it takes for us to do our jobs. None of this stuff just happens. Nothing just kind of comes. Everything has to be built. Everything has to be created and conjured. And you really do need a team that understands this. It took us seven days in a blizzard to build an atrium that we stood inside of for about 40 minutes. And the only way to tap us. Which was wild. And I mean, times where we just did not know if we were going to make it. But this is the kind of things people are asking for. If you go online and you look at Hensley Productions on Instagram, Hensley built this. Hensley builds a lot of atriums. This is a completely different skill set for a completely different client, and I get that. But you can take this and you can do it in an approachable way wherever it is that you're living and at whatever price point that your client has. So this is an open air atrium that we did for a client actually in their backyard. And this was fully built with pipe and drape. So you don't need to do the crazy over the top production. You don't need to spend a half a million dollars just building out this one piece. You can find a way with your rental company to put something up that is still beautiful, that again brings in the twinkle lights because we really wanna see something interesting that gives your clients a nod to what is going on on Instagram and on Pinterest without blowing their budget in a way that just simply doesn't make sense. So now we're gonna do the shameless plugs. I have new books, Leggings Aren't Pants. I get, Leggings Aren't Pants, guys, come on. We can be better. We can be better than leggings for our clients. And I wrote this because I had a client and we went, we had done this beautiful design and all of these cool things. And I get to my production company and my sales rep comes down the stairs and she's like, hi. And I was like. And she hugged me and I whispered in her ear. I was like, leggings aren't pants. And she's like, yeah, they are. I was like, not for my client. Because one of the reasons that you guys are all, if you are in this room, you are not a hobbyist. If you are in this room, you are a true professional. And the biggest problem that we have is as artists, we have difficult lives. Nobody comes over and gives you a degree like they do to a lawyer or a doctor and says, you're a legitimate artist. We have to go and fight and claw for every bit of respect that we get from our families, from our friends, from our spouses, and from our clients because they think, well, it's not a big deal but it is. And the reason that I am always in black or I'm always in a suit is because when I show up, I want to have the authority to say, this is important work we're doing. I'm the custodian of your money, but I'm also the custodian of your memories. And everything that you hope to have in the future, I'm the person who's gonna give it to you. And so we're not gonna show up in leggings. We're not gonna have spelling errors. We're not gonna have crappy websites. We're gonna show up as the professionals that we are and we're gonna demand respect. And that starts with us, and that's also how we make more money. I have AI for wedding professionals. How many people in here are using ChatGPT? Thank you so much. ChatGPT, AI, all of these places where you can actually generate pictures of the things in your mind. I'm speaking tomorrow, and I have a whole place where I will show you what captions AI has written for my social media, what blogs AI has written for my actual website, and how I've gone into AI and said, hey, I'm, do I'm doing this room and this is what I want it to look like. Can you create a rendering for me? AI can do all of that for you. And if you absolutely love design, you love decor, and you really want to learn how to get to the next place in your career so you can go from a tabletop manzanita centerpiece to a bigger tree at an entryway all the way up to a big, massive 16-foot tree. I did create a wedding design master class, and that is a place where I'm gonna teach you about size, I'm gonna teach you about scale, I'm gonna teach you about leveraging color 
and texture so that your designs can be equally timely and timeless. When I first came here in 2021, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know who I was gonna to talk to. I didn't know who was gonna help me. And unfortunately, I struggled to find people who were willing to share. Does that make sense when you guys come here? Today, it's different. Today, I think that you've got a lot of people who are desperate to give information. But the hardest thing is when there's something that you want to learn and you see somebody and you assume like they know this, they have this information. Life is short. You can't make all of the mistakes by yourself. Find your people, find your mentors, learn from the mistakes that have come before you because if you get better and if you get better and if you get better, then the whole industry gets better. When we all get better together as a community, we raise the profile for who we are and what we do. We can command a greater amount of respect and we can make more money, which is really what we need to do for ourselves, for each other, and for our families. So I am Andrea Eppolito. Thank you for coming back and spending your day with me. And I like to leave 10 minutes at the end for any questions. So Q&A, anyone has any question on anything you can ask? So the question was, what's my favorite company for buying chandeliers that have massive impact, but that are lightweight and still have a really solid aesthetic? Now, the truth is they don't exist. <laughs> so if you would like to start one, come see me afterwards and we can start a whole new business. But the thing is, is when you're gonna be doing a really big chandelier, it has to have weight. But what you can do if you're struggling is go to your rental company or go to your lighting company and find out if you can work together. I've sketched chandeliers and then actually had them made out of tubing and then wrapped lights around them because then I can hang it on an arc and I don't need all of the stuff in the ceiling. So don't think you need the exact 200, 300 pound piece. You can actually build something with a frame and have it be hollow and then hang the lights from it. The other thing you can do is you can get a beautiful chandelier and hang it, but don't light it. Don't actually hook it into a power source. Don't have the bulbs in. Instead, find up lights and magnetic lights and shoot the light through your chandelier. It cuts down on your lighting, your power, your rigging course, and it gives you a really interesting sparkle. Yes, they always do get the black on the glass. There's really no way to avoid that black mark on the glass. If you are looking for like a really, really pristine look, there are some great faux candles that still move and still shimmer. And I, I'll be at my booth. I can get you some information on those. But the other thing to do if you want to hide it is instead of putting it in a clear vessel, put it in a smoked glass because then it'll look intentional. And now it doesn't look dirty. It looks like part of the design. Yes. my favorite design tool to use. So let's talk about the progress of design and how you take the stuff between your ears and put it on paper. And other than the trends, this is probably the most important thing that, that I'll share. So when you are going through and you're trying to think about how am I going to show design? First thing you do is you start profiling your clients and you start creating a mood board about them. What do they wear? Where do they live? What do they like? What do they drive? You take that and once you get a full understanding of it, you go in and you go on Google, Pinterest, Canva, Instagram, whatever it is, and you pull work that you feel resonates with them. I don't like showing somebody else's work in my proposal because I, ne I don't want to be a Xerox machine just out there copying the other shit. I want to do my own stuff. So take the image that you love the most. Put it into Canva. Have Canva in the filter area. Have Canva change it from an image to a sketch. And then go into Procreate. Pull the sketch into Procreate and use your Apple Pencil or whatever else it is and actually physically draw on top of the sketch to make it more of what you want. So if you like a really big tree, go pull one of the pictures of my tree, transfer it into a sketch, and now in Canva, you can go and you can color it. 
make the tree red instead of pink, make it yellow, do whatever it is you wanna do. And then when you have the one element, go back in and make it a transparent background and save it as its own image. And then you can start layering all of these pieces in Canva to create your own design. So that now you can say, okay, this is the table from the rental company that I know I wanna use. I have this sketch of a tree, I'm gonna place it because it's transparent right behind it. And then I'm gonna put this chair in. If you're not at a place where you can afford to find somebody to actually render your work, you can piecemeal it. It takes time. When I first started doing this, it would take me hour and a half, two hours, three hours to just get one table setting done. But as you get used to it and you learn how to manipulate the different tech, you'll be able to crank them out in 15 minutes. So you can definitely go, if you're not gonna render your work with a professional, use Canva and use Procreate and start sketching and drawing on top of the pieces that you already have access to. Yes, you're gonna be so disappointed. I don't have a staff. I don't have an assistant. I don't have a full-time coordinator. Um, I'm, I built my business to be intentionally small. I do four to six weddings a year. I charge a premium. I provide a premium concierge level of service. You're gonna pay a premium price, but you are gonna own me for the next six, 18, 24 months. And when you're at that price point, nobody wants to pick up the phone and talk to somebody else. And I don't feel comfortable. It's like the game of telephone. She wants pink. What, what pink? Light pink, bright pink, pale pink? What, like which, there's too much that can get lost in translation. So my clients never speak to anyone but me. And that's a 24 seven proposition. That's not how everybody likes to live their life, but it's how I've chosen to build it. On the day of the wedding, I do have, there are two different types of labor that exist in our world. There's unskilled labor. These are people that you can get from a college. These are people that are interns where you turn around and you go, alphabetize these escort cards. Go and line up these chairs. They don't need to think, they just need to do. And so you can find them, really a college is a great place to go out and get them. But then you need skilled labor. And this is where you start looking for people who see the world the way you do, people who understand how you work. And so a lot of times I will find this labor in two different places. The first is I have, I'm so, so lucky that I have such great friends who are also wedding planners that I will say, if you don't have something, can I book you and can I pay you and hire you for this date? And I pay them really well and I trust them with my business and my process. And I sit down with them in advance and I say, this is what I want. These are all the pieces. And then I really do trust them to where if I step out of the room and they make a decision, even if it's not the decision that I would have made, I've empowered them to do, and there's nothing that you really can't fix. So that's one place. And then the other places that I do have through the courses, I have a work study program that you can enroll in and you can pay and you can come out and you can work one of my productions with me. And so you get to come and you get to do all of the things and I give you tasks and you get to go into the room. And then we make sure that we get photos of you next to the big trees and photos. And it's a great way for people to learn, but that's the best way that I found. I like managing clients and experiences. I don't like managing people. Do you wanna to talk to me all day? Ever, do you wanna hear this on the other? No, save yourself. I'm, I'm much better on my own. Anyone else? I got four minutes into it. Yes, got it. So she asked, what kind of structure do I use for when I'm building the really, really large trees? There's a couple of different ways that you can do this. And I'm gonna take you from super approachable in terms of cost all the way up. So if you wanna build a tree and you need to do it in a cost-effective way, you wanna rent a pillar from your rental company and ask them to wrap it in greenery or paint it brown or put something around it, wrap it in twigs in, um, what's that, the willow that's like super, super flexible. And then on the top, you put something that looks like the trees and the branches. Manzanita is super affordable. You can get manzanita anywhere. And so if you're looking to do something that's more of a raw tree that doesn't have like all of the foliage, you get a big vessel and a big base, you fill it with sand, super affordable, and you stick the manzanita branches in it. 
If you have some more money to invest in a tree, and I'm talking $2,500, $3,000, there are rental companies that actually have the metal bases and they just click into each other. They're like Legos, they snap. And you can just keep building that tree up and then your florist comes in and decorates them. And if you have stupid money, which is everyone's favorite kind, then you actually go and you find a, I use welders, I'll find a welder and I'll say, this tree is gonna hold 200 pounds of florals and I'll have them come out and actually build the tree on site. It's, it sounds a lot crazier than it is. You don't need to know how to do this. Like, you don't know, I don't know how to build a tree. I, I can't change a light bulb. But go out and just figure out like, I can't do it, who can do it? And then just pay them and let them do it on their own. I got two minutes, yes. Are you a planner or are you a? Okay, so you've got different ways that you can charge for your work. We should all be charging a, I'm gonna call it a design fee. This is for the stuff between your ears. This is for the fact that you see a world that doesn't exist, that you can imagine something that your clients just don't see. And you need to charge for that. If they could see it, they don't need you. But so you're charging for the fact that you see a world that doesn't exist. You're charging for the fact that you're gonna go out and find the people and leverage those other artists that can build it. And you're also charging for the risk of this may not work. And so charge a design fee up front. Everyone's market is different. Everyone's placing is different and your clients are all different, but always get a flat fee that just covers you and gives you room to think. When I first started, my first wedding paid me $1,500 and they had a $10,000 budget. My second wedding paid me $3,000 and they had a $20,000 budget. And slowly I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this because, and I know nobody starts here. I didn't start here. I looked at it and said, okay, I made $1,500. I'm gonna take 10%, that's 150 bucks. And I'm gonna go to my florist and say, this is what they paid for. What else can I buy for 150 that makes it look better? And so I was always reinvesting my own money in making the work look better until I got to a place where my clients were spending 75,000, 80,000 on the entire wedding. And then I was like, okay, well now I can invest a little bit more money. And then other people, other florists, other rental companies wanted to come on board. And then I said, okay, I'm gonna have skin in the game. I'm gonna put two grand of my own money into building this business, what are you gonna give me? Because I don't take commission, never taking commission. Um, I think it's a personal decision that you guys all get to make, but if you're gonna take commission, you need to tell your clients because otherwise it's just kind of gross. But instead, I don't need your two grand. I need the work to look $5,000 better. So if I give you 2,000 and you give me $2,000 in product, now we can build a tree. Now we can build a bigger centerpiece. Now we can do something else. And so you've got a way to build on itself. But in terms of charging, once I crossed over $100,000, and then I started charging a percentage. I charged a, an engagement fee and 10, then 15, then 20% of what the client spent total because I felt like the more you need, the more I need to think, the greater my risk, the more I need to get paid. And a lot of people charge like this. Interior designers charge like this. Lawyers charge like this, accountants charge like this. So it's not an unfamiliar process. If and when you get to a point where your clients are spending a half a million and more, that model breaks because it, it no longer makes sense. So then you go back to a flat fee. But charge a design fee, charge a management scope of work percentage. And then if there's anything really wild that you've never done, explain to your clients, this is new. This is gonna require some additional labor and I need to charge a labor fee for it. And if you have questions about that, anyone who has any question that I didn't answer here, she'll tell you. Message me on Instagram. I answer all my own DMs. And so I will, if I don't answer you fully directly in Instagram, I will answer you on a podcast or on a YouTube video and I'll call you out so that you actually get the information you need. Um, they, they are making me leave. <laughs> Guys, this is such a joy for me. It's my favorite week of the year. Thank you so much.